Good day, folks. It's good to be here today on uh, the 11th of August, around 3 o'clock in the afternoon here in Alberta, where we are. And uh, just thank you again once more for uh, inviting me uh, into your places. Pray that your week has been blessed of God and that your family and friends and, and those that you are near and dear to are well as well. So this is what, get back into our sermon series uh, in 1 Peter, A Living Hope. Former author, pastor, and theologian John Stott once said this, quote, We are sent into the world like Jesus to serve, for this is a natural expression of our love for our neighbors. We love, we go, we serve. Jesus, post-resurrection and before his ascension, gathered the 11 disciples in Galilee, and he said this to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You'll find this particular um, quote from Matthew 28, verse 16 to 20. And this command, my dear friends, uh, has been given by his appointed apostles over 2,000 years ago, has been the very DNA of the church since that time. And Jesus' apostles, we find, are described by the Apostle Paul himself as a Gent uh, to the Gentiles as, a f as the foundation of the church. Paul said to the first century, to the first century believers, he described the apostle, uh, them as members of the household of God, with Jesus himself the cornerstone, in whom the church is joined together uh, into a holy temple of God, the dwelling place for God by his Holy Spirit. You find that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, 20, and 21. The body of Christ, another term used by New Testament writers, is describing the organic nature of a positional biblical Truth. The believer's Christian identity is grounded in an historical event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Peter insisted in his first letter that the Church of Jesus Christ is a new people, a new society, neither Jew nor Gentile, or as Peter described, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, we, did, we were looked at that last week. And when we consider Jesus' command to go and make disciples of all nations, we need to realize this command is for all believers, not just for pastors or evangelists or missionaries, but for every single one who calls himself a follower of Jesus Christ. Well, as you and I ponder this, we are reminded again of Stott's words that we began with. Uh, we love, we go, we serve. Between Jesus' command and Stott's encouragement here, we are faced with some questions, some important questions today in our current Christian context. How should God's people live? And as we'll see in our time together today, that this question is more important than we believe or even think. Furthermore, what is our conduct like among believers? Among, among non-believers, sorry. Are we faithful witnesses of the God of Scripture to our neighbors, our, our workmates, uh, our families, our friends, to one and all? Or do we behave dishonorably before the world? Please turn in your Bibles to chapter 2, and we want to get some context again. We want to read verse 1 to 12 together. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like new, newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men by the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, 
a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that they may speak against you so when, that when they speak against you, against you as evil doers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Dear Father, we thank you for your word. And I pray, Lord, by your Holy Spirit that you would mold us and shape us and change us by the Spirit through your word. Uh, not only for our own good, but also for the good of our neighbors and our friends, and even our culture, our society. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So now that we have read together uh, these first 12 verses, we want to pay uh, some closer attention to verse 11 and 12. And we find here a natural structural break in the Apostle Paul's letter as he moved into the second part of his letter. The first part up to chapter, uh, verse 11 and 12 of chapter 2, we find are, many, are mainly theologically focused with uh, the occasional application to a believer's life day by day applied in that text. But beginning here, verse 11, the Apostle Peter's focus is more of a practical nature as he addressed day-to-day -day living as a believer. We see as we continue to read through chapter 2, and if you were to read in 3 and following, uh, Peter focuses on submission to political authority, a believer's relationship with their employer, uh, relationships between husbands and wives, and suffering in a believer's life, to mention a few. And underlying all of Peter's comments here, we see the conduct of believers is highlighted among non-believers. So as we begin to unpack these two verses, please join me as we read together again verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. I think we can start with the word beloved, as translated by the ESV, which I am using. If you have an NIV, the translators there have translated this Greek uh, word, dear friends. And when we check with the Greek lexicon, the BDAG, BDAG, the Greek adverb transliterated there, agapeo, agape, sorry, agape tos, which is, a, I guess, a derivative of agape, can also mean, quote, to one who is in a very special relationship or to one who is dearly loved. What we have here is something that's similar to a parent and child relationship. Thayer's Greek lexicon highlights the New Testament use of this word by Christians as, quote, bound together by mutual love as one to another. With this in mind, all we can say this with clarity, that Apostle Peter here was, more, was writing as more than just an apostle, appointed by, as an apostle appointed by Christ himself. He was a brother in the Christ to his audience. Peter was not writing from some ivory tower, or just giving some good advice and pointers on how to deal with trials and struggles in life. Yes, Peter was, of course, inspired by the Holy Spirit to write what he wrote here in 1 Peter. Yes, he was an apostle to the church of Jesus Christ, as we know, a foundational apostle to the church, even the church today. Peter was writing as one who had his own trials and struggles because of his faith in Christ. Peter walked the talk, my friends. He lived the talk. He walked the talk and he lived the talk. And one day would be executed for his obedience and faithfulness to Christ. See, Peter knew what his audience would be up against for their faith in Christ. 
and his pastoral heart would say, Dear friends, I urge you as sojourners in exile to abstain, exiles, to abstain from the passions of the flesh. That's your verse 11. Please notice with me now the phrase, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. This phrase brings us right back to chapter 1 where we find Peter was writing his letter to who? To those who are elect exiles. Chapter 1, verse 1. And from chapter 1, verse 1 to our text today, Peter there began to interpret for his audience what God had created because of the work of Christ on the cross. We find Peter's statement here, for example, in chapter 2, verse 10, in a very good way, summarizing Peter's theological explanation. Peter said, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. That's verse 10 of our chapter 2 here. You see, friends, God fulfilled his redemptive purposes in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and thereby creating a new people, if you will, a new society, a new society distinct from Jew and Gentile. We go to Apostle Paul for commentary on this, and in his letter to the Galatian church, he said this, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are one in Christ Jesus. You'll find that in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. And remember the last time we were together, just a week ago, that the Apostle Paul had reinterpreted an Old Testament type to describe a New Testament people of God, of the first century of you and I today. Peter said in verse 5, You yourselves, like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Friends, every believer, each believer, is a living stone in the spiritual house, the spiritual temple, if you will, offering spiritual sacrifices to God. Let's press pause for a moment as we now turn to more personal level, and let me ask you this question. Have you become comfortable in your skin? Have you become comfortable in your skin? They might be saying, what do you mean, pastor? Well, this is what I mean. I mean, the opposite of this particular saying that many of us are familiar with, it goes like this, are you too heavenly minded to be earthly good? I mean, the opposite of that. Are you, too, are you too earthly minded to be of any heavenly good? Let me remind you again that Peter didn't waste any time exhorting his first uh, century audience. Back in chapter 1 again, he said, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, also be called holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, and then he quotes Peter quoted from uh, Leviticus chapter 14, 44, where God said, you shall be holy, for I am holy. We find this in chapter 1 of our letter here, 14 to 16. So again, how should God's people live? What is your conduct like among non-believers? Are we faithful witnesses of, God, of, of the God of the scriptures to our neighbors, uh, to our workmates, our families and friends, to one and all? Or do we behave dishonorably before the world? Again, Peter had made his point. The New Testament people of God, that's you and me, was created by God for God. They are God's possession. Believers no longer belong to the world, for we see here in verse 11, Peter is clear of that as he calls his first century audiences elect exiles, sojourners, and exiles. As one commentator put it, quote, as members of a new people, Christian followers are aliens on earth, but they should behave honorably in human societies, just as human societies expected of other resident aliens. You know, friends, to behave honorably begins with each one of us. We need to be brutally honest with ourselves as we look around our current Christian culture and the culture around us. We need to ask ourselves, does the outside match the inside? 
Are we on the road to holiness or on the road to worldliness? We look at this word here in verse 11 that's translated by the ESV Passion. Some of other ways of translating it also, for example, it could be lusts. That's a good way of translating this word. And we find an example of this also in the letter that James wrote, exhorting the believers against worldliness. James in chapter 4 said, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war with you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. James chapter 4, verse 1 to 4. Apostle Peter here in verse 11 said, Abstain from the passions of the flesh, which, wear, which wage war against your soul. Again, we could say, abstain from the lusts of the flesh, personal and cultural as well. The Apostle Paul, in his first letter to the church of Corinth, was dealing with a church that was very popular, very rich, very influential, yet had idolatry and sexual moral, immoral, immorality within. And he, he deals with that by saying to those first century believers at Corinth that they should stop their idolatry, they, they should stop their sexual moral, morality. Put it this way, flee from idolatry, 1 Corinthians 10, 14. My friends, you, we have to realize this, that a believer's life is a daily spiritual battlefield. This uh, term here used in verse 11, which uh, uh, the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul, this is war-like language, battle-like language. And time is not our friend as usual in order for us to dig deeper into the Word of God on this particular topic, topic. But suffice it to say this for today. We are reminded that we must rely on God's power, not our own, when it comes to spiritual warfare. Friends, Jesus' name is not some magical rem remedy, some incantation to be used willy-nilly as we see so often in some very influential churches today. To the point we are instructed by the Word of God, and the Word of God instructs us to put on the whole armor of God daily and depend on the power of the Spirit and the Word of God, which is the sword of the Holy Spirit, as we daily engage in spiritual warfare. Let's keep it really simple, folks. And here it is. Pray, read, study your Bibles, go to church, and yes, dear ones, you must, we must engage society in the private and public, public sphere, in all strata of public life, politically, socially, or otherwise. We're not to stick our heads in the ground. Well, let's move on to verse 12. There the Apostle Peter said this. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. I want to repeat what Stott said to remind us. He said, we love, we go, we serve. You know, when we look at the whole of Peter's letter from beginning to end, we find a major theme is the suffering for one's faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And we know that the first century church was struggling to find its identity in their pagan culture in, real, in many ways. And in real ways, they paved the way for you and me today. And the New Testament writers such as Peter, they're defining a Christian ethic that would encourage and help his audience deal with day-to-day -day life as they dealt with trials and sufferings and persecutions for their faith in Christ. When we think of ethics, as defined by uh, science, for example, the, we can define it this way, quote, a set of moral principles, the study of morality. But we're talking about Christian ethics. 
Stephen West, who writes for the Gospel Coalition, provides for us a working definition of Christian ethics. Stephen said, quote, Christian ethics is guided by God's revelation in Scripture above other systems of thought as it seeks to love God and neighbor. The highest ethical duty of a Christian is the same as the greatest commandment. Love God and love your neighbor. Friends, Scripture is the Christian authority for ethics. So how are we to conduct ourselves as we live our lives in our cultural context? Well, the short answer is this. The same as our first and second and third and fourth century brothers and sisters. Let me share an example of this to you. The year was approximately 165 AD. That's a few years ago. It was during the reign of Emperor Marcus Aurelius. We find that an epidemic swept through the Roman Empire. Now speculation has been uh, what this epidemic was. We can't be sure, but it, there was one. But whatever the cause of the plague, it was lethal. It lasted 15 years of its, and it is suggested that at least a third of the population may have died. There was no treatment. We go fast forward about a century later, approximately 251 AD, another plague came along. And in this plague, those who could not flee, like the rich that had summer homes or could afford to go to other places, they avoided any contact with the afflicted. And victims that had uh, symptoms of this plague were literally thrown in the streets. That doesn't matter if they were family, friends, loved ones. They were tossed in the street and left to their own devices. And during these two plagues, Christians cared for their sick. They stayed and they cared for the sick rather than desert, desert them, rather than tossing them into the street. And in doing so, saved many lives. It seems that their basic care, basic nursing care, simply providing water and food would help these weak, sickened people to recover instead of die. And this would be extended to their pagan neighbors as he would uh, give an example of, of Christian mercy and, and love. And many even of their pagan neighbors were restored to health as Christians extended God's mercy and served others in the midst of this great suffering. And what's interesting to note that it seems that the majority the Christians survived, and also the church would grow, incredibly grow, because of this, uh, this, self, un, uh, this merciful conduct of Christians. So are we faithful witnesses of God, of the God of Scripture to our neighbors, our workmates, our families, and our friends, and those that we meet along the way in life? Apostle Paul put it this way, do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent. Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked generation among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast to the word of life. You find that in Philippians chapter 2 verse 14, 15 and 16. When we think about the world around us and the culture around us and all the uncertainty, do we circle the wagons and do we create these uh, spiritual safety bubbles, safe places, safety, safe places. Most certainly not, my friends. We serve our God and other people, even though some might, might speak against you as evildoers. Verse 12. We go to chapter 3 of this letter that Peter is writing, or wrote this, the letter that Peter wrote here, first letter. There he exhorted the Lex exiles and you and me by extension to do this. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteous, righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that be God's will, 
than for doing evil. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13 to 17. When we think about all that's going on in the political realm and U.S. and Canada and around the world, where publicly and on social media, Christians, those who call themselves Christians, slander and slam each other and slam politicians and this and that, that's a shame. Shame, shame, shame. Shame on the church for being like this. I feel great shame in that. So do we behave dishonorably before the world? Most certainly not, my friends. Again, the Apostle Peter exhorted his audience, and by extension, you and me, in the fourth chapter of his letter, Peter said, the end of things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers over a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as, God, as good stewards of God's varied grace. First Peter, First Peter chapter 4, verse 17. And following. So what? So what, my friends? What is the takeaway from you and me as 21st century followers of Christ? Again, let's just keep it simple and remind ourselves of what Stott said. We love, we go, we serve. I have a habit of attending the gym early in the morning, at least three days a week. It's been a lifelong habit. And I'm grateful to be able to do that still. And I often listen to music, whether it's, uh, it's usually Christian music and sometimes uh, Western Christian gospel. And I want to share a song by one Cody Johnson that he called, Make Me a Mop. Remember earlier I said, you know, honorable, uh, being honorable and being humble begins with you and me. Just listen to these words. It may encourage you to uh, pray and ask God to help you in that area. It goes like this. Make me a mop to clean up the messes that I've made in my life. Lord, make me a spoon, smooth on the edges, when my words want to reach for a knife. Make me a shovel, make me whatever, a handle on a cup you glue black together. If breaking a man just makes him better, then do what you gotta do. Make me the nail, you hold the hammer. Drive me straight and drive me true. Lord, build me a heart with room for forgiveness and just let me live there for a minute or two. Make me a shovel, make me whatever, a handle on a cup you glue back together. If breaking a man just makes him better, then do what you gotta do. Take me, break me, Lord, make me. We love, we go, and we serve. Lord God, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the Apostle Peter and all the apostles, the foundation of the church from the first century to this day. We thank you for their inspired, inspired letters, your word to us. I pray for us as we engage our family, our friends, our churches, the private sector, the private sector, all strata of culture, politically, socially, etc., that we would do so humbly, remembering what Christ has done for us, that we would be bearers of good news, of mercy, of humbleness, that we would be honorable in our culture. And thank you, Lord, for this message. Lord, may you build in us a life that honors God and glorifies him. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, folks. God bless. Shalom.